every once in a while, there will be a PR effort, there will be a radio station, a TV station, whatever it might be that talks about your product without your knowledge, and boom, something explodes, right? And we've seen that a couple of times, and now we have a better feel for it, but it is in a number of different ways. For a small company, it can offer challenges that are really not expected. This is the e-commerce brain trust, a podcast about building momentum online for established consumer brands. Join our hosts and their expert guests for high-level conversations about e-commerce strategies, trends, and innovations. Access our brain trust and boost your brand's e-commerce potential. Hello, and welcome back to the e-commerce Brain Trust. I'm Julie Spear, one of your co-hosts. And on today's podcast, we're mixing it up a bit. I'm joined by Noelle Barnes, who is a member of the Bobsled Marketing Team and who's been a voice on the e-commerce Brain Trust on a few other occasions. Noelle is officially joining Kiri and I as a co-host on the podcast moving forward. So I wanted to officially welcome you to the, the podcasting team, Noelle. So welcome aboard. Hello. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. We're glad to have you. You've, um, like I said, you've joined us on a few episodes talking about vendor and interviewing brands at a recent conference that you and Kiri attended together. So excited to get your insight as we move forward on the podcast. Thank you. Yeah, I was at the Catalyst 2018 convention for Channel Advisor, and I did some live interviews there with, with some people that were attending as well. And that was really exciting to actually be there on the ground doing those interviews with people. So Face to face, face to face interviews. <laughs> well, like I said, today's format of the podcast is going to be a little bit different. Kiri is joining us in a different way. She's going to join us through an interview that she had recently with Dan Menk of Invitamin. Dan and Kiri discuss Invitamin's approach to growing their brand through a targeted omnichannel presence while also building out their catalog around their proven winners. And so in just a minute, we're going to listen to Dan and Kiri dig into Invitamin's e-commerce experience. Noelle, after listening to the interview, do you have any points that you would encourage our listeners to pay close attention to? Yeah. So one of the one of the things that Dan and Invitamin had to deal with in the last year and a half or so is a problem that I'm sure a lot of sellers on Amazon wish they had, which is having a product or a suite of products going viral. So a little over a year ago, Invitamin had a moment where one of their products were picked up by a major media outlet, which was great, but it's kind of this double-edged sword where it's not at all predictable. So it was great for brand awareness and it was terrific for feedback from customers. But that overwhelming demand created all this kinds of inventory and manufacturing challenges. And so that's a great story that he takes people through about how they worked through it and they learned from it and they now feel better prepared. And also one of the key takeaways that I really appreciate about Dan's conclusions is that how his his perspective about the customer really aligns well with Amazon's customer-centric focus. So that's that's a great story I hope people will stick around for. The unexpected downside of your product going viral. Who knew? Exactly. Yeah, it's, it is definitely a double-edged sword. All right. Well, thanks for that, Noel. And we'll pause here and Noel and I will be back in just a few minutes after we give a listen to Dan and Kiri's conversation. So welcome to the show, Dan. Thank you for coming on. Why don't we start by you telling us a little bit about Invitamin and how you came to start the company? Yeah, sure. Thanks for having me. Invitamin started probably five or six years ago now, really, with a full effort. The idea being we were really struggling, a business partner and myself were really struggling to, for our own families, go out and find what we believed were truly natural products, right? Natural products for our entire family for our children at an affordable price. So really the effort with Invitamin was more about finding products that families can afford that were widely and easily available, that were made with ingredients that were EWG verified, that we believe to be helpful. And I think as probably all of your listeners know, the term natural is not well governed at this point. So, you know, we we would find a lot of brands that advertise themselves as natural, but didn't necessarily contain what we thought to be natural ingredients. So we, we made the effort to go out and build this brand, use it with, within our own families, create products that, you know, we believe we could use in our own homes. And then if they were up to our standards, take them to bigger and better commercial points and really, and really run with them. So that's where 
the whole idea started. I myself have five children. My business par- partner, Matt, has three children. Wow. And, so yeah, you got a lot so of guinea pigs. <laughs> a good uh, test group between us. So that works out really well. And so the products that, that went over well in our families were the ones that we would take to the next level and, and really try and run with. And the key there, you know, obviously being with the number of kids that we have within our families is affordability, right? We wanted to make sure mm-hmm. that a brand that was affordable for, for the average family, which we didn't seem to find to be really accessible out in the marketplace. There's a lot of luxury, organic, you know, what you'd consider to be healthful brands out there, but mm. nothing that really to fill the mainstream that the average family can afford. Right. And so to that end, your your strategy and, and distribution channels for Invitamin are, are pretty varied. So you're selling on your own website, you're selling on Amazon, you're selling on Target.com as well. So tell us a little bit about your the various selling sales channels that you have and why you're pursuing that omni omni channel strategy? Sure, yeah. We and very honestly, when we started this brand up, it was very much a grassroots effort. We didn't go into it with a really large budget to begin. We went into it with an idea and investing our own money into it and kind of trying to build from the bottom up. So a lot of this has been learning as we go, somewhat baptism by fire with some of the products that we've launched and and uh, trial and error. So we started out initially with with e-commerce channels only. So that being Amazon and our own website. From there, we grew through a number of different e-commerce channels, including your uh, you know traditional ones being eBay and, and Etsy, having an Etsy store and things like that. As the products gained popularity, we began selling into some of the bigger e-commerce channels, which have included Target, and getting into some some various stores, which have been the health food and the grocery, the health grocery stores. And so as we've grown, we've really actually had to taper back and re- and try and refine that just a bit for a number of reasons. Amazon presents its own challenges as you grow on that channel. So we've really, with enlisting your help, trying to um, gain some control over that, make sure that it's manageable for us. Trying to really build and encourage the channels that make the most sense for us. And we see Target as being one of those long-term in addition to Amazon. And probably scaling back a, a few of the others just so that we can really put our efforts and resources into the ones that, that make the most sense. And going into 2018, we're working hard on also expanding into different brick and mortar retail shops across the country. We're not necessarily looking at getting into the larger brick and mortar shops right now, but a lot of the small to medium size regional players, those are the ones that make sense for us because they target, you know, what we consider to be our direct audience and our, our most sensible audience, which is that average family, you know, with children. So that's what we're looking for right now. The Amazon channel mm. continue to be a, a growth factor for us. And we have built on that through some of the EVC listings, offering different types of packages on there and really trying to provide a more robust offering. Whereas when we, when we began, it was really just three or four or five basic listings without having multiple options for each, et cetera. So we're really, as we go into 18, trying to get our arms wrapped around that, build out some of the listings that we have that have been successful and that make sense for our customers, and then going from there. So right now, that's that's kind of been our focus. Yeah, so t- tell us a little bit more about that list product listing strategy, because I think that's interesting. There's, there's, a, there's a way to grow sales and reach, reach customers just through sort of expanding a little bit upon your existing products and offering new sizes and flavors and multi-packs and things like that. So tell us a little bit about what you've done so far and what your plans are there. So with Amazon specifically, and, and, uh, you know, as I'm sure you know, with a a small company, we don't have a lot of room for error, right? So we can't go out and launch Mm. new products and new listings without having a a fair amount of confidence that they're going to do well. So in making, as I said, in trying to make a more robust offering for our customers, what we've done is taken some of our successes and tried to, to build on them. So our most popular product by far and away to date has been our activated charcoal tooth and gum powder. That's been the one that customers have really mm-hmm. grasped onto and it fits a number of different applications, right? It fits the, the person who wants a better, more healthy option for just daily brushing. It fits the person who wants an affordable whitening. And so where, where we've traditionally had just one parent with a number of different flavor offerings that fit as children within Amazon. We have now started to build out some different bundles of those, which include toothbrush package bundles, toothpaste 
right. package bundles, different charcoal package bundles, which um, fit a, a hopefully a wider audience. So we've really tried to build on the success of that product by offering more to it within those listings. And we'll continue to do that. We'll see what right. works and just continue to, to, to put resources into that. And then as I'd mentioned as well, we have really worked hard to make sure that our listings are as full as possible. So the EBC, I think, has been a big part of that, right? We've, we've uh, started working on some of the video for various listings. Our imagery mm-hmm. has improved. I think it's where it needs to be at this point, but it's improved quickly over the course of the last year. And we'll continue to put resources into that as well so that we keep making a listing that without the, the customer having the ability to touch and feel and smell a product, they, they get everything else, right? They're able to see people using it in real time in video. They're able to see the full imagery of it and really get a, a, as good of a feel yeah. as you can get uh, digitally without having to um, hold and touch the product in your own hand. Right. And so um, has selling into, I know that you mentioned with brick, your brick and mortar footprint that you're looking at the more regional stores, but have you considered selling to Whole Foods or is that not really fit that model for you? Right. Yeah, we've certainly considered that. Whole Foods makes sense for us in some ways, but not in others. We are at a point right now where one of our bigger challenges in the last year and a half with our growth, we've had some significant growth and some of it is, has been live and learn, right? As we're trying to build our inventory out, make sure that we're managing our raw materials. And, and a big challenge for a company like ours has been the raw material piece and that some of the raw materials that we use, they're unique. They come from different parts of the world. They're not necessarily easy to get a hold of. So they do take some more effort to make sure that we're managing those supply channels. And so we've had this where we have fallen behind in our, our production because of that and not been able to keep up with, with some of the demand, both from retail and just from our direct customers. So we're trying to be very careful and have a, a strong strategy in place for supply chain so that we can continue to manage that. And again, you know, being a small company, we don't want to overdo it on the finished goods. We, we But at the same time, we have to make sure that we're managing the, the raw materials. Right. So that's been a work in progress. We're getting there. We're getting better at it. But to go into a Whole Foods and not being able to keep up with some of that that demand would put us in a, a bad spot. So we're evaluating that. That's probably more of a 2019 to 20 goal for us. Right now, we're trying to build and, and manage channels that we know that we can have a, a, a better feel for as we go into 20. Right. And on the topic of, of managing demand, <laughs> you had an you had an interesting incident a couple of years ago where, where your products went viral. And I'd love to hear you tell that story and some of this uh, unexpected pitfalls of having your product just go go viral online. Yeah. Yeah. And it was really that charcoal tooth and gum powder that, that took off for us in such a big, big way. We had a point... Uh, you know, very organic, for lack of a better term, organic marketing efforts where we did catch a couple of PR channels that we didn't necessarily expect to catch. And a lot of people started finding us on Amazon. And it, it was great, but it, it, it definitely offered some challenges for us as a small business and not, not being able to keep up with some of that demand. So as we transitioned every, everything over to FBA and trying to keep the shelves stocked with product, it was, it was a, um, an interesting time for us as a growing company. So while it was really great, a lot of customers found us on Amazon and discovered our product. Our, our feedback coming from customers was fantastic from a product quality standpoint, etc. We were uh, caught a little bit off guard with trying to keep up with some, some of that demand. So we, we struggled through that. We worked really hard to prepare going into the next year to make sure that, that we were well prepared for it. And that's the funny thing about being on a channel like Amazon, right? Every once in a while, there'll, there'll be a, a PR effort. There'll be a, a radio station, a TV station, whatever it might be that talks about your product without your knowledge. And boom, something explodes, right? And we've seen that a couple of times. And now we have a better feel for it. But it, it is uh, in a number of different ways for a, a small company, it can offer challenges that, that are really not expected and trying to stay ahead of the curve when it comes to managing your inventory. So these are just some of the things that we've learned. And again, you know, we didn't go into this with, th- this really started out on its own. So our entire brand started out as selling on Amazon, selling on our own website, and literally selling five, six, seven units a day to growing to the point of selling, you know, hundreds. And so trying to get a good grasp on that and really keep up with it has been, it's been fun, but there have been some, some blocks that we've had to put in place and a foundation that we've had to build to make sure that we 
manage it well for our customers. Because the last thing you ever want to tell a customer is that you're out of product, right? When they're excited to come and find you and they've heard a lot about you and they come looking for you and they can't buy from you, that's heartbreaker. So we've really had to work to, to lay some of that foundation, yeah. that groundwork to keep up with it. Yeah, it's a real Goldilocks problem because you you don't want to you don't want to be overstocked and have all your capital tied up in inventory that's not going to be moving in the next couple of months. But at the same time, it's a huge lost opportunity and potentially damaging to your brand as well. You think about someone's looking for your particular product; it's out of stock on Amazon. If they really want that product, they're probably going to go ahead and buy competitors, and so then you've kind of you may have lost that customer over the long term as well. You're 100% right. That's exactly where the balance falls into place for us. If we had the capital to invest in huge units of finished goods, things would be a little bit different, but not every company has that ability. So that's working the balance right there. And a lot of it's just timing. So just to, uh, to throw a little yeah. bit more in about my um, personal story when it comes to this is that my, myself and my business partner, we've actually traded commodities, agricultural commodities, for about 15 years now. And this was a, an opportunity that came to us and we, we started working, building the name in Vitamin a number of years ago, but we did it all while still managing our commodities trading business. So this was, for lack of a better term, was kind of a side gig. And mm-hmm. as it grew, it grew to the point where we knew we had to yeah. put more, more effort and more resources into it. And so just this past February, I left my commodities trading and started managing in Vitamin on a full-time basis. So that's been really exciting for me. Again, you know, it comes with some risk and some challenges, but it's been really fun. And it's been nice now to be building a company in which we're fully invested and are, are putting the, the personnel and the resources into place to make sure that it's building properly and that we're overcoming some of those hurdles that I talked about earlier and having a full-time availability. I'm running the company now as a, a CEO. We have a, a warehouse and staff in place to fill orders. And so that's been really a, a, an excellent portion of our growth right there, an excellent piece, one of those building blocks that's helped us keep things managed as we've ended 2017 and as we get into 2018. So there's a lot of good things on the horizon. And now we feel like we're really getting our arms wrapped around them. That's great. Congratulations. Thank you. So what, final question here is you're now selling in 30, over 30 countries, selling your products in over 30 countries. So tell us a little bit about your international selling strategy and, and how it works. Sure. So not much of this has come to us. Instead of us going to, to find these different resources across the world, but if you think about some of the ingredients that we use in our, the, these natural plant-based ingredients that we use in our product, they've originated overseas for tens, hundreds, thousands of years where people in these various countries across the world have been using them in different applications. So they're traditionally much more familiar with some of the plant-based ingredients that we use. So there is already an understanding and, and even maybe a following or a popularity for some of these. So it's less of an adaptation for some of these customers. So we found that throughout Asia, throughout different parts of Europe and South America, these customers already have a knowledge base of some of the ingredients that we're using. And that's where some of the products originate. So we have found different distribution partners and different retail channels that we have started working with on a very small basis, right? Our, our biggest challenge with overseas customers is the shipping portion of it. The shipping product overseas, especially if it's not a huge volume of product, can add to your cost. And we're trying to keep a, a you know an affordable product for the end user. So we found some ways to work around that. And I think we have some improvement going forward, but there are a number of channels that we have found, again, throughout Asia. So we have product going into Korea, into China, into Japan, and customers have, have seen, so far, really, really enjoyed it. It's been great feedback. The process has been managed well. So we sell to these customers on a, most of them on a small to medium-sized basis because we're still really challenged with our U.S. distribution. So we want to make sure that that's our priority and, and really establishing that flow for our U.S. distribution and then building on the overseas distribution as we go forward. So everything that we're doing overseas right now is in small to medium volume and growing. We have a number of, of these just partners who have come back to us and asked us for more product going forward, but we've really had to be careful. And that's one of those lessons that we've learned, right? We've had to be extremely careful with making sure that we're not over committing and, and under delivering to any of these people because that'll set you back a, a ways. So we're, we're very careful with that, making sure that we're growing these channels at the right pace and managing them as uh, best as possible. Yeah, that, that's a great strategy there because your distributors are kind of taking on some of that risk of uh, the risk and, and the cost of, of getting products of, to the end customer. And you're able to sort of leverage a more of a wholesale model to get your product out into those countries, but not dealing with the shipping and customs and complexity that comes from 
from that taxes, inventory storage. And yeah, because as much as we love Amazon cross-border FBA, it does create a whole host of compliance obligations as well. Once you're actually, you have inventory in the in the UK or in the EU or in Canada or in Australia, it creates a whole new level of paperwork for businesses. Absolutely. Yep. Logistics become a major challenge and really we can't be all things to all people today, right? We're hoping to grow a lot of those channels as we go forward, but we have to do it in a way that makes sense. So it's one at a time right now. We're just trying to, to manage them one at a time and make sure that we feel good about each one before we move on to the next. Right. Great. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story and some tips for other brands looking to expand their catalog and and expand their markets as well. Thanks for coming on the show, Dan. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. So thanks to Dan Mank for talking to us about Invitamin. One of the things I really appreciate, like I mentioned earlier, was how Dan talks about his customer focus is really all about making sure that you have product for the customers because they can't buy what they don't have at Amazon. And he really feels passionately that he always wants to make the customer happy. If the customer wants something, it should be there. And that really aligns well with Amazon's own customer-centric focus. One of the key takeaways from this interview that's so interesting to me is the international expansion part, because there are some real challenges today. I know that there are a lot of sellers who listen to this podcast who have been on Amazon US for a long time and are thinking about that next move, that international expansion. And so I like his story about how they go abroad and how they have some really interesting ingredient specific challenges there. It's not so much about educating other regions about the ingredients like they do in North America. It's actually about educating about the brand and how the brand pulls those ingredients together and makes something new and different for those regions and and testing those waters and doing small quantities. It's definitely an education process about the brand for the regions, but it's also an education process for environment about those regions too. So what did you take away from this, Julie? Yeah, I, you know, the very thoughtful and methodical approach to to building out their presence across the board is something that that jumped out at me. The points you make about their international expansion, I think just kind of underscore it further that even when they were considering their omni-channel presence at the get-go, they wanted to try multiple channels and then identify what works and zero in on those targeted channels that work well for them that the customer base aligns with their product type and the channel just supports their their brand as well. They do have a very thoughtful approach to expansion. And so you could see it in the international expansion, as you explained. You could see it in how Dan explained their approach to their omni-channel presence. And then also in their approach to building out their catalog. I, I feel mm-hmm. they have an emphasis on being clear in their brand and who they are and being a uh, finding very clear ways to articulate that to their customers. Yeah. Yeah. And that that also shows up in the way that they approach their listings on Amazon. So they are using every bit of real estate they have at Amazon to explain their products in the absence, like you said, in the absence of a customer being able to touch or hold the product, they want to help the customer make an informed purchase decision by using everything that Amazon makes available to them on that detail page. So whether it's EBC or video, or things yet to come, he wants to make that listing full as possible to help that customer make that purchase decision and help convert that customer. And I think that's key. I think and there are so many sellers out there who don't use everything that Amazon gives them for free to be able to make that purchase decision when a customer can't actually physically hold the product. So that's a really good key takeaway as well. Yeah. And that's something that we've touched upon often in this podcast as well is the importance for brands to really define it, their presence, define who they are, what their product is, who their customer is on Amazon. I think a lot of that energy often takes place on their own brand website, but mm-hmm. leveraging the tools that Amazon offers to define the brand on Amazon is equally as important. And yes. it sounds like Invitamin is taking those steps to ensure that they are making their brand clear in, in a competitive market on Amazon. Absolutely. Yep. Well, Great. I... I really enjoyed listening to Kiri and Dan's discussion, and it's great having you on the podcast as well. So I I look forward to getting on the mic with you again in the future to talk about more brands and e-commerce on Amazon. Thank you. Me too. My favorite topic. (laughs) Oh, good. (laughs) All right. Thanks, everyone. And we'll catch you next week on another episode of the e-commerce Brain Trust.